God called this one simple man named Moses to go into Egypt where he was literally raised and go into the house he was raised in and tell the Pharaoh there, the king there, if you will, the Pharaoh, that he's got to get millions of people, some three million people out of Egypt and take them through the desert to Canaan, to the promised land. He's got to deal with that. Now, I'm sure it was exciting for them. I'm sure when the, when the word got around, they didn't have social media. They didn't have Facebook and, and, and all these other things on social media to be able to, to tell their story and say, hey, we're, we're leaving Egyptian bondage. Moses has come to set us free, and, and we're leaving Egyptian bondage, and we're going out so that we can get into a promised land. And so they were excited about that. I, I'm sure there was a buzz of some people saying, well, we've never been out of Egypt before. They've been there for a long time, over 430 years they spent in Egyptian bondage and, and, and so now they, they've got to a place to where they're, they're actually in uh, uh, a comfort zone, if you will. This is all they've known. This is all they've been a part of. This is all they are and so this is how they've lived and so they're pretty excited about getting out of 430 years of Egyptian bondage and slavery Especially after God announces in in Exodus chapter 3, verse 8, listen to this. I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's like the lottery. I mean, I mean, they've hit the lottery. This is the grand payout. This is the big job right here. This is it. We, God has said he's taken us out of this land, and he's going to take us to a land that's flowing with milk and honey. Now, let me tell you something. Anytime God tells you he's going to do something in your life, you better brace yourself and be ready and understand that for every step God says he will take you, the enemy's going to try to knock you back two steps. He is always going to fight you. There's a, there's a huge misconception within Christianity where people, some preachers are even preaching it, some people are teaching it, that, that, that if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that all of a sudden you've hit easy streak. And it's just not the case. It's just not the case. It, it is, it is, there's something that happens on the inside that causes you to want to fight. But it's not easy, so he's always going to fight you. Sometimes it's like that with us. We hear about what God is doing and what God wants to do, and we get excited, and we say God's going to take us somewhere, and God's going to do something in our lives, and so we're ready for it, and we get excited until something comes along to try to stop us. And then we can get beat down, then we can get held back, and then we can get almost in a, in a position of defeat to where it feels like God is nowhere around and God isn't doing what he promised he would do. And it's not that, it's the enemy trying to stop what God is doing. So what is it that keeps you from your Canaan? What is stopping you as an individual from from seeing, possessing, and, 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 and taking in what God has promised you for you, for you? For you, everybody has a promise from God. And, and I feel like everybody's been given a, a measure of faith because the Word of God says each person has been given a measure of faith. And so here, here it is. Here we are marching towards a promised land. Here we are marching towards what God's got for us. We know God's got something for us. We know what God's Word has said. We know what God has spoken into our spirits. And we're headed in that direction. And then we hit a wall. Then we hit a stump. Then we, we see a stumbling stone. Something's there. Well, what is it? Let's look at what they went through, what they dealt with. And I want to look at the things that attempted to stop God's people from going into Canaan and see if it relates to us today. And the first one is this. Is a Pharaoh stopping you from your Canaan? In other words, are people stopping you from being all that God wants you to be? History itself records how wicked this man was. Uh, His name was Ramesses. He was a a type of Hitler, if you will. He he used everything he could in his power. Um, Exodus chapter 1 tells us, 
Uh, at chapter 1, verse 8 tells us that he had a total disregard for everything that Joseph had ever done. The Bible says that, that he didn't even know who Joseph was to a degree in the way he ruled. He was wicked. He was mean. He was deceitful. He, he brought harm to them. He'd done everything he could to hold them back. He used tyranny to oppress the people of God. He, he did it to stop them. He did it because he didn't want them going any further. He used the Israelites as forced labor. And while he used them as forced labor, if they stumbled, if they made a mistake, if they were too weak to work, if they got too old to work, he would just kill them. He would just kill them. And, and, and it was, I mean, he was a, a tyrannic person. He'd done everything he could to stop them from ever leaving where they were at in bondage and cause them or allow them to move into what God had for them. Now think about it. This type of man is, is the Pharaoh over Egypt. And this type of man is the kind of man that Moses has to go into, he's mandated by God to go into his, his chamber, to walk into this palace, to walk into his office, if you will, and tell them that God said, let my people go. Now, that's a big step. That is a huge step. But what Moses had to do was he had to stand up. He had to say, I know God is leading me in this. I know this is what God has said. And just like everybody figured he would do, the Pharaoh said no. The Pharaoh said no. Pharaoh says it ain't had to. Moses says, I've been sent by God. I've been sent by God to get the people of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. You're not going to kill them anymore. You're not going to rule them anymore. And it's time for me to, to lead these some three to four million people out of Egyptian bondage. And we're going to go to the promised land. And we've got to do it. I've been mandated by God to do it. And Pharaoh says, it ain't happening. And guess what God said? That ain't no problem. That ain't no problem whatsoever. Let Pharaoh say what he wants to say. My friend, God has never been hindered by stubborn people. He has never been hindered by stubborn people. He has never been hindered by people at all. Listen, there was a story in the late 1800s that a man by the name of Walker, last name of Walker, created a pistol, and it was named the Walker 44. Each one of them had this inscription on it. It says this, Fear no man, no matter what the size. When in trouble, call on me and I will equalize. It became known as the equalizer. Not just the Walker 44, but the equalizer. I just want to tell you this morning, my child of God, that God is greater than the equalizer. God is greater than any Pharaoh you'll ever meet. Throughout the Word of God, there have been people who were determined to destroy everything God had set out to do in His people's lives. He, he, every bit of His work, they, they've set out to destroy it and make a problem with it. There was a guy named Herod, and Herod, he was a king, and, and he, he did the same thing. He caused all kind of havoc on God's people, but you know what happened to Herod? He fell dead, and the Bible says that worms ate his body up. The Bible talks about a man named Haman, a guy named Haman. He built this. He was totally against everything the man of God, the prophet of God, was doing to, to increase the power of the people of God and to increase their blessings. And he connived and he lied and he had this hangman's thing, this gallow built to hang the prophet of God on. And when he got in the way of God, God began to show up in a miraculous way. And you know what? Haman wound up hanging on the gallows or from the very rope that he had built for the man of God. God's not hindered by stubborn people. I want you to know God's not scared of stubborn people. And then there's Goliath. Goliath was killed not only by Israel's future king, but by God's anointed warrior and God's anointed king, God's anointed man of God. And, 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 and there's Goliath, this big statue of Goliath, this big man that was standing in the way of victory and power. But God was not hindered by a stubborn giant. 
Later on, David wrote this, and I love it, Psalms 27, 1 and through 3. The Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger, so why should I tremble? When evil people come to devour me. I want to read that again to you. When evil people come to devour me, when my enemies and foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though a mighty army surrounds me, my heart will not be afraid even if I am attacked I will remain confident listen to me don't let some Pharaoh stop you from entering into what God's got for you some of you sitting here this morning you've got people in your life you love them you care for them they they love you somewhat and they care for you somewhat but they're holding you back They're pulling you back. God's got plans for you. And God's got vision for your life. And God's got a destiny for you. And God's created these things for you. And God wants to bless you. But for some reason, you're letting them cover up the vision that God's given you. You're letting them hold you back. And you're allowing them to become a Pharaoh in your life. Well, God wants you to know this morning that that Pharaoh has to get out of your life. You must move past them. You can love them but sometimes you've got to love folks from a distance. Hello somebody. You've got to move into the promise of God and you're never going to do that as long as you let people hold you back. People will tell you you can't be healed. People will tell you you can't be saved. People will tell you you can't do what you know God has talented you and blessed you with the ability to do. People will say and do whatever they can. And you've heard that old phrase that says, misery loves company. That's what happens with some people sometimes. They're miserable in their life, so they want you to stay in the misery with them. But God doesn't want you in misery. God hasn't saved you to be miserable. God has saved you, set you free, and delivered you so that you can move forward into the promise of God to a land that's flowing with milk and honey. God's got a promise for you. He's got a promise for you. He's got a Canaan land waiting on you. Don't let a Pharaoh hold you back. Second thing they faced was a wide sea. A wide sea. That wide sea represents things. Things. Physical stuff. Exodus 14 records the story of how the Red Sea opened up. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being there and walking across on dry ground. Better yet, can you imagine being there and watching this guy named Moses hold this old piece of wood out over the sea? And the Bible says it it wasn't like it on TV. He just holds the rod out there, and all of a sudden the waters go, oh, no. God took some time. Let me tell you something. If you're going to get to Canaan, sometimes you just got to sit and wait and let God do what God's going to do. Hello? Sometimes we get down and we pray and we we say, Lord, I need this and Lord, I want that and God, I got to have this and God, I need the other. And we pray and and if God don't do it while while we're still sitting there, then it's, it's all over. It's all over. You know, it's almost like having a flat tire on a vehicle and getting out and saying, God, I need four tires blowed up and I need this one blowed up. It's the only flat one I got, so Lord, I need it blowed up right now. And if it don't blow up, then God's dead. Sometimes we operate on that kind of faith. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen this morning. But this, this, this sea begins to open up during the, the course of time when Moses is standing there and it opens further and further, and the wind that's pushing the water back also dries off the bottom of the seabed. I don't know if you've seen this the other day, but there was another article that came out <clears throat> that they have sent divers down now. They have discovered that in the area to which they have zeroed in where the, the children of Israel went across on, on dry ground, uh, across the Red Sea, that they have now found, archaeologists have found that there is there's proof that it happened Because at the bottom of the Red Sea, they're finding old ancient chariot wheels and pieces of chariots that date back to biblical times of Exodus. 
And they're, they're sending divers down to, to try to get this stuff up and to get it out and to look at it and, and, and pay more attention to it. And, and I heard one guy say one time, he said, well, if the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea on dry ground, then, then what they done was they found what they call a ford and they went across and the water was only about 12 inches deep. And another guy said, well, praise God, when the, when the Pharaoh's army came up behind them to, to overtake them and they tried to cross the Red Sea, it's still a miracle because God drowned an entire army in 12 inches of water. <laughs> Amen. Amen. See, God is still good. The enemy tried to use the size of the things, the size of the sea, to stop God's people. He said, he, he, he brought them to the Red Sea and they're standing there and they're saying, what, what, what am I going to do here? If I, if, if I try to get across this Red Sea, we're going to drown. It's a sea. It's a big body of water and it's deep and it's dangerous and, and they had knowledge of it. And now the army is behind them and the Red Sea is ahead of them and the Canaan land, the promised land, is on the other side of the Red Sea. What are they going to do? And the enormity of the problem, the enormity of the things that they were facing was huge. People find themselves in spiritual captivity so many times because they think that what they've got in their life is huge and it's too big for God. It's too big for God. God, I, I would tithe, but if I do, I got so many other obligations that, that this money situation I'm in is too big for God to take care of. And so what they do is they stay in captivity and they keep, keep themselves bound in spiritual captivity, in financial spiritual captivity, and they can't go forward and get to the promised land and get to the Canaan land that God has promised them. And the reason they can't is because they're just holding back, holding back, holding back, holding back. Things are holding them back. A lot of times people can't find spiritual freedom because things outside of worship and things outside of praise and things outside of glorifying God, things outside of, of being at church and learning and studying the Word of God has got a bigger glitter to it than what we find in the church, in the church activities. Now, I just want to tell you this, my friend, you need church. We, we need this collective body of believers to come together and worship together. You, you need Wednesday night uh, midpoint Bible study and training and teaching and discussing and reading the Word of God. You need it because this thing, this thing we call life, this thing that we call possessions, these things that we have for ourselves have become so glamorous and so big and so astronomical that we think God can't change it. And things hold us back. But I want you to note here this morning that God has never been hindered by the world He's created. Anything in the world has never hindered God. Also, don't you think if God created something, it'll obey him? When you start looking at a wide sea in your life, when you start looking at things that seem to be too big for God, they're too big for you, so they must be too big for God, don't you know if God created it, it's got to obey him? I'm talking about a God that said, listen to one prayer from one man of God, and the sun set still for a few hours. I'm talking about a God that used one man to stretch a rod over the sea and he parted the waters. I'm talking about a God that said to Elijah, if you'll take that coat that you've got and slap the river Jordan, it'll part for you. And that same coat was handed off to Elisha that I preached about just the other day a few weeks ago. This same man, Elisha, took the same coat, the anointing of God, and slapped the same river and it parted so he could go back across it. I'm telling you that. That God, that God, if he created it, it'll obey him. Judges chapter 5 verse 4 says this, Lord, when you marched across the fields of Edom, the earth trembled and the cloudy skies poured down rain. The mountains quaked in the presence of the Lord. My friend, don't let the size of the sea keep you out of Canaan. Don't let it keep you from the promise. I know there are things that the enemy puts in front of you and tells you you can't do it because of this. You can't do it because of that. 
I saw a picture on Facebook the other day. I thought it was amazing. There was a guy with one leg in a wheelchair in a sanctuary vacuuming the carpet. He said, "If you," the caption was, if you want to do something from the Lord, you can. Don't let things stop you from getting the promises of God. Don't let things stand in the way to look so big and so bad and so awful and so uh, enormous that, that, that the enemy keeps you out of the promises of God. God's got promises for you and if you'll just march forward, if you'll trust the Lord, if you'll say a wide sea and a Pharaoh is not going to keep me from the promise, God will take you forward. Third thing is this, Hunger and thirst. Hunger and thirst. You know what that is? Feelings. I don't like to be hungry or thirsty. You can look at me and tell. Hair loss don't bother me, but I don't want to go without eating. Can you imagine being in the middle of the desert with no food and no water? No food, no water. Three million plus people No food, no water. That must be awful. Science tells us that a human can last approximately three days without water. That's what medical science tells us. And there are factors that play into this. The biggest factor is what a person eats. I was amazed when I started looking at this stuff. Someone who eats a lot of fruits and vegetables may last up to five days. Tell you right now, I'm out in about two and a half. <laughs> Magoner. Fruits and vegetables. If that's all I could eat, that, oh man. I like them, but I don't like them all the time. But people that eat a lot of bread and a lot of grains, they may not last as long as three days. That's me and several of y'all, right? Amen? Ah. Uh-huh. The rest of you need to tell the truth. We'll pray in just a minute. Well, I got to thinking when I started looking at this information, and I got to thinking, well, you know, they had to survive for 40 years in the wilderness. And I know what the Word of God says. God told Moses not to do it, but he did it anyhow. He hit the rock with his staff and water poured out of it because they were thirsty. So they, they had water. They had that water for that time. And what did they eat? Well, I know the Bible says that at one time they were tired of manna. We'll get to manna in just a minute, but the Bible says that quail, just flocks of quail come flying in, and so they ate quail. Well, that's not a fruit or a vegetable. And then the Bible says that the main dish for 40 years was what? Manna. And what is manna? Actually, manna is whatever it needs to be. That's what the, the interpretation of manna really is. Well, what, what God gave them to eat, he gave them manna. Now, some people might think God just made it very hard for them. God just really dealt them some big blows right here. When bread is an issue, if you eat too much bread, you can't live. But for so long, if you eat too much bread, your days are shortened. If you don't have food and water, so what's going on here? Some people might think that God did them dirty. God did them wrong by giving them bread. But David said in Psalm 46 and 1, God is our refuge and our strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So what those some people forgot about manna was this. Manna has another name, and it's called bread from heaven. Not bread from Sunbeam, Walmart, uh, Wonder Bread, or nothing else. This is manna from heaven. This is bread from heaven. And Philippians 4 and 19 says this, but My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory in heaven by Christ Jesus. My friend, it may look like a mess. Your situation may look like a mess, but God specializes in blessing a mess. And when your mess is blessed by God, your Canaan is coming. So here's what I got you to under got to get you to understand this morning. You got to understand that if God sent it, he's going to take care of it. If God put you there, he's going to see you through. If God brought you to it, he'll take you through it. And there's no mountain high enough, no sea deep enough or wide enough, no valley low enough that can stop God if you're trusting him. God's going to take you where he wants you to go. 
the bread from heaven. Manna wasn't just bread. It was, it's defined as whatever it is you need. So God specifically designed this great stuff to come out of heaven and be waiting on them. They didn't even have to get up in the morning and pat out no biscuits. They just got up in the morning and there was manna all over the ground and they would go out and they would pick it up. And if Susie over here was a little slacking and dehydrated, her manna gave her water. If George over here needed a little protein, he could eat the same manna and get some protein. If somebody else over here had an iron deficiency in the middle of the desert, they could pull up the same manna and it would be iron for them. I came to tell somebody this morning, if you will just trust God, if you will believe God, if you will lean on your Lord, if you'll lean on your Lord, he will take you to your Canaan. Somebody ought to give him praise. Hallelujah. My Lord. The last thing is this. This is a big one. It's called a loose tongue. <laughs> I heard somebody go, Rrr. a loose tongue. Yeah, a loose tongue. You know what this is talking about? Yourself. The you in you. He said, I am that I am. But you have got to start speaking who you are. You got to start saying it. I can tell you you're blessed until I'm blue in the face. And it ain't going to change if you don't start saying and declaring you're blessed. So what else could keep you from your Canaan? Your tongue, you. I mentioned the 12 spies last week, and, and, and actually it's what prompted me to preach this message this morning. You see what a wicked Pharaoh, a wide sea, and hunger and thirst could not do? Bad reports did. In less than five minutes, a bad report held them up. They, they got past the Pharaoh. They got past the Red Sea. They were dealing with the hunger and thirst because every time they turned around, God was providing. They've got out of Egyptian bondage. They've got out of all the, the things that was holding them back. They've been in the wilderness and they are ready to go into the promised land. They've dealt with this for 40 years. They have trusted God. They've murmured against God. They wanted to kill the leadership. They loved the leadership. Everything for 40 years they've wandered in the wilderness. And they've seen God day after day after day after day for 40 years take care of them and leading them to the promised land. And don't forget there were some people that said we ought to turn around and go back. But you remember this. The Bible says if a man puts his hand to the plow and looks back, he's not fit for the kingdom of God. So you remember that. Don't you go back. I had it better when I was smoking dope. I had it better when I was an alcoholic. I had it better when I was this. I had it better when I was that. No, no. No, you did not. No, you did not. That's a lie of the enemy. And don't you believe his lie. But here they are. They're, they done been in this thing for 39 years and, and, and 11 and a half months. I'm, I'm just guesstimating here. They have finished their route and they are ready to go into the promised land and, and they're standing there at it. They're, they're within a few steps of getting into the promised land. Twelve spies go in. They come out. They have these reports. Every one of them, now watch this now. Every one of these 12 spies has a report that the land is indeed flowing with milk and honey. Every one of them said it. Oh, it's great. It's good. Yes. Oh, my Lord, you ought to see the grapes. You ought to see this. You ought to see that. You ought to see that. The other. You, you, uh, it's an amazing piece of property. This is definitely a well-blessed promised land. It would be awesome to have it. All 12 of them said that until it come time to do something. And 10 of the 12 spies said, but we can't take it. We can't take it because of what we see. We can't take it because there's another Pharaoh in there. We can't take it because uh, there, there's, there's other things up there. There's, there's stuff there. There's not a Red Sea, but there's some big people. They're giants. 
Some of them are Philistines. They're, they're just huge and we can't do it. That tongue, that mouth, that, that wagging tongue, if you will, that loose tongue. Those individuals themselves talk them, them own selves out of the promised land. And what we say and believe is more than just important. It is extremely important. Some people, maybe, maybe you walk in and, and you got a, a raise on your job and you just say, oh, no, oh, that was just God. No, you had to work for that. You had to work for that. God favored you and he blessed you, but you had to do your part. The Bible is very clear when it says if you've got faith, but you're not doing anything with your faith, it's just like a dead man. It ain't no good. You, you got to do your part. You got you to gotta do your part. Some people, I seen this too the other day. I don't know where I seen it at. Somebody sent it to me. They said, you know, it's amazing to me how many people want to check every week. And it's a great way to get one. If you want to check on Friday, go to work on Monday. Right? Because, just let me move on. I ain't going to get into all that. Let me just move on. What we say and believe is more than just important. It's extremely important. Our tongue of confession is linked to our heart of faith. What we say matters. What we say matters. I catch myself sometimes saying this. I got, I got a knee problem. I don't know what it is. I think it's got something to do with uh, um, old age. I think that's what it is. I think that's what it's probably going to wind up being. But my right knee swelled up the other day, and I was limping on it. And, and, and my wife was telling me to elevate it above my heart. And I said, dear God, I'll have to hang from the ceiling to get my leg, knee above my heart. And uh, we all laughed about it. And then, you know, they told me to put ice on it, so put ice on it and all that kind of stuff. But you know what I catch myself saying sometimes? I'd get up out of my seat. Oh, man, what, is your knee hurting? It's killing me. It's killing me. And I, I, I have to watch myself and not say that it's killing me. Now, I'm not into that hang, uh, name it and claim it stuff. One guy said, name it, claim it, hang it, and frame it. I don't know. I, I'm not into that. I don't believe that you can just speak a brand new pickup truck into your yard. You can for about three months. If you don't make three payments, they'll repo that baby. Right? And they may get it at two payments. I, I don't believe that you can just speak it, but you've you got to put some faith into action. But you've got to start saying things and speaking things that are, that are bringing life into you and not death into you. Proverbs 18, 21, the tongue can bring death or life. I talked about this several weeks ago. My friend, listen to me this morning. Your tongue can, can bring poison or it can bring praise. Your tongue can build up or it can tear down. Your tongue can speak good or it can speak bad. It's up to you. You get to control that little muscle. You ever, and, and I guess it really is a, a real thing, but they, they say these, these things called Tourette's where people just, they can't, they just holler things out. And, and I don't know if that's a true disease or not. I've never do, indulged myself into learning about it. Maybe, maybe that's my fault. But we get to control this. We get to control it. Listen, when my children were growing up and we'd give them medicine, especially when they were real small, my wife would take that little dropper and she'd say, baby, you got to take this medicine and you put it in their mouth and they'd hold it. And you know what she'd do? She'd go, and then, and then they'd, it'd make them take it. But until she did something to override them, they controlled that tongue. You could squirt it in their mouth, but they controlled it. We control this. We can control this. It can bring good and blessing or it can bring bad and cursing into our life. It, your tongue can get you into Canaan or your tongue can keep you out of Canaan. It's up to you. It's up to you. Well, my, my husband ain't never going to get no better. Well, he sure ain't if you keep talking that. My wife ain't never going to learn how to cook. You're right. She's not if you keep talking that. My kids ain't never going to act right. I didn't mean about the fire kitchen lady over here my kids ain't never gonna learn oh, they ain't if you keep talking that 
My finance, I'm never going to make enough money. You're right, you're not. If you keep talking that, I'm, I'm never going to get better. I'm never going to be healed. You're right, you're not. If you keep talking that way, because your tongue controls it. Remember what a Pharaoh, a wide sea, and fiends, a, 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 a hunger and thirst could not do. A bad report with a tongue did in five minutes. There's an old saying that says, you, what you see is what you get. Well, I want to tell you the Bible says what you say is what you get. What you say is what you get. What you say is important. Listen, salvation is linked to what you say. The Bible says this in Romans 10 and 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart, you shall be saved. I have people all the time say say to me, well, I believe I'm going to heaven. I believe in God. I know who God is. And I tell them, but do you confess it? Do you accept him as Lord and Savior? Well, I ain't done all that kind of stuff, but I, I know who God is. Yeah, and so does the devil. Guess where he's going? Right? Healing is linked to what you say. James 5, 14. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you. How do you call somebody? You gotta say it. Strength is linked to what you say. Joel chapter three verse 10 says, let the weak say I am strong. You can lay in a bed of defilement and, and defeat all you want to. And if you just lay there and say, I can't get up, I can't get up, I can't get up, I can't get up, then you're never going to get up. But if you'll say, let the weak say I'm strong, if you'll say, I'm going to get up, I'm getting up, I'm going to do this, I'm going to be more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ who said I could be, I'm going to do this. You've got to learn to say it. Don't let what you say keep you out of your blessings. Don't let it keep you out of your Canaan. The first 31 verses of Genesis chapter 1 records 10 times God said. 10 times it says it. God said, let there be light. God said, separate the the water from the earth, from the ground. God said, separate the darkness from the light. God said, that let us make man in our own image. God said, he said it 10 times. It was only after God said something that the thing of God did something followed it. Only after God said it Did God do something to follow up what he said? Paul wrote in Romans chapter 4 verse 17 that God calls those things which are not as though they were. God did that. God did that. Listen, Canaan, your Canaan, your blessed life, I'm not saying you're going to live disease free. I'm not saying the enemy's not going to attack you. I'm not saying you won't face hard times. I'm not saying difficulties won't show up. I'm not saying you won't stand by a dying loved one. I'm not not saying you're going to have a perfect life. But I am telling you this. I'm telling you when you trust God, when you believe the Lord, when you lean on Him, when you trust His Word, when you say regardless of what a Pharaoh says, what people say, what things try to do to me, how big something looks, I'm going to say I am blessed by God, I am anointed by God, and I am moving forward in God, and I'm telling you, telling you whether it's on this earth or the world to come, the life after this, you will be blessed because those who trust the Lord will always find God standing by their side. You trust Him. You trust Him. Hey everybody, this is Pastor Bud Womack from Life Point Church here in America, Georgia. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for joining us today in this worship experience. Our prayer is that the message you've heard is relevant for your life for today and also that it builds the body of Christ as a whole. We'd like for you to go to our YouTube channel, click on subscribe so that you can be a part of the next messages that come out. We'd also like to give you the opportunity to be a part of Life Point Church as we continue to point people to abundant life. If you'd like to give and help support this ministry, go to our website, www.lifepointamericas.com. Click on the give button. You'll be able to follow the steps to support this ministry.